can turn in your Bibles, if you would, with me this morning to Genesis chapter 12. We were in verse 10 last week, thinking through, however, that theme, that great theme of Egypt that we find throughout, uh, particularly the Old Testament, certainly carries over into the New. Uh, thematically, Egypt is a reflection, of course, it is an actual nation located in North Africa along the river uh, Nile River and Delta, but it's also a representation in the scriptures, throughout the scriptures, of the unbelieving world, of the natural and carnal man, of his motivations, and of his desires. Now, when we talk about the world in the Bible, we're not simply talking about the things that are on the earth, this rock, um, this ball, um, the, the, the material things that we have, these chairs, this pulpit, and such. We're talking about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. We're talking about that which was corrupted in the Garden of Eden uh, when Adam chose to partake of that fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that was a bit of an aside last week from the week before, where for several weeks we have been tracing a different theme. So last week we were introduced to the theme that is Egypt in the scriptures. But we've been tra tracing another theme, and it is in fact one of the primary themes that we trace throughout the Old Testament, and that is the theme of faith. Two messages ago, we spent time formalizing the definition of faith through the example of Abram in the early verses of Hebrews 11, thinking through Abram's choices um, that Hebrews 11 highlights and magnifies, and then allowing those, um, those choices to, we, we backfeed them into the Genesis account to understand the thematic expressions of faith throughout. And that theme of faith continues this week as we explore Abram's efforts to settle into the land into which God commanded him to go. And we're going to learn another lesson about faith, a lesson that faith is not just a destination, faith is also a journey. We can be tempted when we think about the idea of faith, we even mentioned it in Sunday school this morning, to think of faith destinationally. That faith is something that, we're, we, that, that, that we have that is good for us to get to heaven, that heaven is the objective, that faith is the way that we get there, and so faith is rooted in this need to accept Jesus Christ as Savior to get to heaven, and that's absolutely true. But there's far more to faith in the scriptures than just the destination that is the kingdom, that is heaven to come. Recall a couple of sermons ago when we were thinking through Hebrews 11, we read this in verses 8 through 10. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should afterward receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. The faith that we see in Hebrews focuses here on that destination. That throughout the lives of Abraham and also of his son and grandson, Isaac and Jacob, they sojourned in the land because what they were actually seeking was a spiritual merit, not a material merit. What they actually thought, sought were eternal riches, not temporal riches yielding the things of earth by faith for the things of the life that is to come. But faith is not just a destination. Faith holds that high and ultimate promise in this case, in the case of the followers of the living God, the ultimate promise being the kingdom of God. And then he calls men to align their individual decisions with that ultimate promise. So that as we walk on a day-by-day -day basis, we are walking in light of that faith. We are taking a journey of faith with the ultimate object of our faith in view. Which means faith is not just about arriving at the conclusion of what God has said is true but then aligning my life and expectations with those promises on a day-by-day, moment-by-moment basis. And this means, as it relates to the way in which we live our lives, faith will not necessarily always feel destination-oriented. Oftentimes, faith is going to feel journey-oriented. Faith will often consist more of the day-in and the day-out Moment by moment decisions to obey, to submit, to trust, to hope. As we sang this morning, just a few minutes ago, trust and obey. 
that, that daily decision to die to self and to live to Christ rather than necessarily the overriding expectation that as you're, you're dealing with the nitty gritty of life, you're not necessarily always thinking about heaven. You're not always thinking about the destination. Rather, we're busy with the journey. In reality, it is the day-to-day -day faith where we most often fight our battles, where we find our successes and our failures. And what we learn today through Abram's journeys is that this day-to-day -day struggle, the journey of faith, if you will, is not just a modern battle. We see that Abram, too, in his day, was learning how to walk by faith. He had been given promises. He yielded to those promises. He made definitive decisions in his life based upon those promises. But that doesn't necessarily imply that he had it all figured out. It doesn't imply that he didn't still have to fight the daily battle over fears, over concerns, over worries, over uh, unknowns, over things that came up unexpectedly in the manner in which he lived his life. And today, the way I'm approaching the text, we'll say it this way, Abram is not going to do the best job. This is not, we're not looking at Abram's best day today as we consider the final verses of Genesis chapter 12. So recall where we left last time we were together in the text. Verses 8 and 9 of Genesis 12 says this. And he, that would be Abram, removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed going on still toward the south. So remember we talked about this, right? Abram attempted to settle in uh, Sycam, which would be Shechem, and he did not, he was not able to. For one reason or another, the text doesn't tell us why. Then he goes to this mountain between Bethel and Hai, and he attempts to settle there. And we know he's attempting to settle because he builds an altar. It's one of the things he does when he wants to settle. He builds an altar unto the Lord. And he attempts to, to, to settle there, and he did not. And then he is continually moving south throughout this time. And then we read last time, verse 10. And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. And we did consider this verse last time from the perspective of Egypt. But in this verse, we also read of, if you will, the first true hiccup along the journey. Now, I'm going to be making some speculation I made that, this speculation last week. I'm making it this week as well. And the speculation I am making is that God had given Abram enough information to understand that he was supposed to go to Canaan. And I make this speculation for a couple of reasons. First, we recognize that when Terah and Abram left Ur of the Chaldees and ended up in Haran, their initial destination was Canaan. So I make a measure of, of, of an assumption that they were intending to go to Canaan because God wanted them in Canaan. And then when they settled in Haran, God then called Abram out and had him continue to move south. I also make this assumption because we know that Egypt is not the place where Abram intended to settle, never intended. He never built an altar there. He never settled there. It seems quite obvious that he knew he was not supposed to go that far. Now, I say these are assumptions. And the reason why I say these are assumptions is because next week when we look at Genesis 13, we're going to find that the text does not actually, God does not actually tell Abram in the text that the land of Canaan would be what Abraham is, Abram is going to get until chapter 13. So I am inferring that Abram did have a measure of understanding already that Canaan was the land where he was supposed to be. Maybe that's not true. Maybe as Abram ends up down in Egypt, God simply told him, leave Haran, leave your family, go south. And he ended up in Egypt. Um, and it wasn't as much of a faltering of faith as I'm imputing to Abram today. And if so... Um, uh, well, j just know that I'm making some assumptions. Maybe, maybe Abram is not doing as bad as, 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 as I might make it sound when he ends up in Egypt. But considering we know the theme of Scripture of what Egypt is supposed to represent, I think we're pretty safe in saying Abram knew he was supposed to be in Canaan. But do know that I'm making a few assumptions this morning. So Abram enters the land. God tells Abram to leave his family, to leave his, his home in Haran, and to go south, to go into Canaan. To go into a land that he would show him is what we have in Genesis 12. 
God says he would bless him there. God says he would become a blessing there. God says he would bless them that bless him and curse them that curse him. Through him, all the families of the earth would be blessed. And so Abram enters into that land. But immediately, Abram faces obstacles. He doesn't have a place to settle. He tries a couple of places. It's not working. And now there's a famine that's sore in the land. Not easy to settle into a new land with your cattle and your herds and your family. No children yet. All of these things, his servants. We'll find that he has quite a few servants. We'll be finding that out in a few chapters. It's not easy to settle into a land when there's a famine. And so he, re, he, he comes immediately into obstacles. And I don't know if you've ever been there where you are very confident that the Lord has a direction for you to go in. And the path is clear and you, you're optimistic and you set out on that journey. And then when you hit that, that place where you believe the Lord has for you, you hit obstacles. And the question is on, in that day, what is that going to look like? What's going to happen on that day? How are you going to respond in that day? A couple of weeks ago, we thought through the reasons why it is that God is worthy of our trust. I don't know if you recall that message where we spoke of the, the, the foundational idea that, that we serve a God who is worthy of our trust. And when we were in that passage, I appealed to Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, which says this, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. When we are confronted with problems that threaten what we expect from God, on the basis of broader promises, we have two options on the table. We can seek our own solutions, lean on our own understanding, or we can seek to God's solutions, acknowledge God in all our ways. I can say in that day where things, I'm following God. Okay, God, I trust you. I'm following you. All of a sudden, I hit an unknown. God, I didn't expect this. I don't know what to do with this. You made these promises. Now this is here, and it's in the way. And I can either say, okay, I guess it's time to take it back. It's time for me to take, take back control. I'm going to do, I, 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 I've got a solution in my mind, and I'm just going to fall back upon that solution. Or we lean harder. We trust deeper. These are the options that are presented to us in that day of unknowns, in that day of trouble. Now, Abram was a man of faith. Abram is one of the great men of faith in the Bible. Abram was a man who had the faith to acknowledge God to the extent that when he was asked by God to leave his family, when he was asked by God to leave, if you will, the safety net of his entire community and to journey into a, 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 a land that, that he was a stranger, he was willing to do that. He was yielded to that. He picked up his, his herds. He picked up his servants. He grabbed his wife. He took his nephew. And they went, not knowing where, where exactly they were going, not knowing what they were going to face. But then when they did face some very hard times, provision was scarce. We find that Abram did not stay in that land of promise in that land that God said was his and where he would bless him. Instead, he leaned upon his own understanding a little bit. Instead, he said, there's this place called Egypt. Egypt has this amazing river that flows through it called the Nile. And then there's this amazing delta at the end of it. Egypt, um, it's a very rare thing for Egypt to go into a famine or into a drought because they're so fertile. Egypt is not in a drought. Egypt is not in a famine. There's still plenty there. So I'm going to take everything I have and I'm going to keep moving south. Now, last week we took time to understand what Egypt represents. We've already stated that. We see the character of this right here. Abram is a man of faith. Abram is a man who left his, his house, who left his family, who left his land to follow the Lord. But that doesn't mean Abram had necessarily figured everything out. And this is both common and at least to me very relatable. You desire to do what's right. You desire to serve the Lord. You understand his promises, particularly broadly. 
that are perhaps even more nuanced and specific things that you have seen in your life. And you, you, God has led you to a place and, and you believe that you're there by his will. And you've seen the, 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 the hand of God guiding you and directing you in this way. You've sought to wise counsel. You've aligned it with the word of God. You've searched the spirit of God. You found peace in that thing. And now you're facing roadblocks. You're facing speed bumps. You are confused. You don't know quite what to do next. You, you've hit re, a real bump along the journey. You thought you were where you were supposed to be, but it's as if the, the, the Red Sea had parted and you were walking through it. And now it's crashing down around you and you don't exactly know how to orient yourself rightly to what's happening. I believe, and again, I'm making some inferences here, but I believe that that's a little bit of what Abram faced in the day that he went down into Canaan and he couldn't settle and there was a famine in the land. I believe he was confused in that day. And so let's see how this played out, him going down to Egypt. And then we're going to connect some of those dots to us this morning. The text continues in verses 11 through 13. And it came to pass when he was come near unto Egypt that he said unto Sarai, his wife, Behold, now I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee, they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, that thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. I've made some inferences to this point as to whether or not Abram coming down to Egypt was a step of faith. But at this point, I'm, I don't need to make inferences. Abram, it's quite clear here that as he, is, as he is coming down to Egypt, he is still, or he is leaning on his own understanding. He is starting to try to figure out how it is that he can manipulate circumstances to be to his best advantage, even in ways that are lacking in integrity. He is pursuing his own solutions here. Abram is faced with real problems in the land of Canaan. He has no place to settle. There's a famine in the land. But it's not as if he's not moving into some other problems as he finds his way down to Egypt. He's leaning on his own understanding. He leaves the land in which God has promised future blessing. He heads down to Egypt where presumably due to the general stability of the Nile River, there is no famine affecting them. And as he nears Egypt, we see the first consequence of Abram leaning on his own understanding. By leaving the land of Canaan and moving into Egypt, he is introducing a new complication into his life and one that God has not given him the grace for because he's not where God's grace is. One of those complications is that Abram was concerned that the culture and people of Egypt did not fear God and so they would not honor the claim that Abram had to his wife Sarai by virtue of their marriage. He was concerned that they would kill him in order to be able to have her. And this being because, Abram says, she was a very beautiful, a fair woman to look upon, a beautiful woman. Though at this point in her life, she was greater than 65 years old. And we know that because in Genesis chapter 17, verse 17, Abram says that he is 100 years old. He's actually at the time 99, so Abram was rounding. And his wife was 90 years old at that time in Genesis 17, 17. Uh, and if Abram was rounding up, then he may have rounded Sarah's age too. Um, but she's somewhere around 90 years old in Genesis 17, 17, when Abram was around 100 years old. So we'll say a 10-year gap between them. Well, if you recall, the Bible says that Abram left Haran when he was 75 years old, which means Sarai was somewhere around 65 years old when they left Haran. Of course, then they went to Shechem and then between Bethel and Ai and then moved down south. So I don't know how long that would have taken, but she's over 65 years old, we would presume at this point. Either way, She's still beautiful, right? She's still so beautiful, in fact, that Abram thinks that the people of land might kill him to get her. So he requests that Sarai consent to being called his sister so that no one would kill him for her. Now, this is sort of a lie. Um, she, we, find, we don't find in this particular passage. We find it later on in Genesis when he's talking with Abimelech that um, she is, in fact, his half-sister. She is the daughter of his father, but not the daughter of his mother. 
And so there is a, a, a half truth to this. We might be able to parse between lies and deceits and truths and half-truths and whatever else, but the fact of the matter is this. He is, one way or another, seeking to misrepresent his relationship with his wife in order to save his skin. At least that's what Abram envisioned. But it didn't work that way. He envisioned that this lie would allow them to live in peace without Abram suffering the possibility of danger, but it's not how it played out. Verses 14 through 16. And it came to pass that when Abram was coming to Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. The princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house and he entreated Abram well for her sake. And he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. So Abram leaves the land that God has promised and he comes into Egypt. He is leaning on his own understanding and he's trusting that he can get his family through this famine even though they're not in the place where God had promised to bless them. He then says, well, you're my wife and God has given you to me and we have this relationship and God's promised to bless me and give me a child and it's kind of important that I have my wife if I'm going to have a child, but I think that the Egyptians might kill me. So I'm going to keep leaning on my own understanding and I'm going to compromise my integrity and misrepresent my relationship with you in order so that the people don't kill me for your sake. You see the spiral of faithlessness. But what Abram did not anticipate in all of his leaning on his own understanding was that the person who would become interested in his wife, who is represented as his sister, would be the Pharaoh himself. See, Abram was not a poor man. He was a fairly wealthy man. We would presume that he is much wealthier coming out of Egypt than when he went in. But he is not a poor man. He is a man of means and, and he is a man of, of, of influence. And it would not necessarily have been difficult for as suitors would come asking if they could take Sarai for themselves for Abram to say, no, I'm a wealthy man. I'm a powerful man. You're not good enough for my sister. 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 Go away. And, and I, I'm going to continue to protect her. I'm going to continue to, to have her for, uh, uh, under my authority, and you all go away. Hard to do that, though, when the Pharaoh is the person asking. So he could have pretty safely rejected the other suitors on the grounds that they are not worthy, but the Pharaoh is knocking on his tent, his, his, his metaphorical door. So Pharaoh entreats Abram, for Sarai, he actually takes her first and then entreats Abram for her with sheep and oxen and asses and servants. And Abram is now in a difficult spot. He has, for lack of better term, lied to the whole community, misrepresented his relationship with his wife, and now one of the only people in the land, wealthy and powerful enough to thwart his plan, unknowingly does exactly that. Maybe he shouldn't have leaned on his own understanding. But it's also here that we learn an important lesson about God's promises. We talked about it last Sunday evening in our Amos um, message. Romans chapter 11 verse 29 tells us that the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. This is stated by Paul in reference to the promises of God to the nation of Israel and the posterity of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you're interested in learning more about that, go listen to the message last Sunday evening. But the essence of it is this. When God makes a promise, he keeps it. He doesn't turn back from it. When God promised to make Abram a great nation, he knew who Abraham was. He knew Abram's insecurities. He knew Abram's propensities. By the way, when he promised, Abram, I'm going to make of you a great nation, and I will bless them that bless you and curse them that curse you, and in thee all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, God said that to Abram, knowing that Abram was going to find his way down to Egypt. And so God steps in here and rescues Abram from this difficult situation. Now, we have two interesting things happening here. The first is this, that when God has a plan for us and we step out in faith and we follow that plan and we struggle along the journey, we hit moments of stumbling along the journey. We trust that God is perfectly capable of making up for those difficulties. 
that if I make bad decisions, if I have instances where I fall back upon my own understanding while I'm walking in the direction I'm supposed to walk in faith, God will protect and preserve in those times. But also we see here, and we see this clearly, that that doesn't mean these things don't come without consequences. Yes, Abram is going to be protected and preserved by God here, and he's going to bring about the circumstance whereby Abram gets his wife back uh, unharmed. But that doesn't mean that this whole detour did not come with consequences. And this is that balance that we need to strike, that we don't fall back and say, well, I know that the Lord uh, has promises for me and, and he's directing me in a certain way and so I can take liberties with his grace. We don't want to do that. But we also can thank God that when God sets us in a direction and calls us in a way that he's not just there with his hand on the trap door waiting for us to make the first mistake so he can pull that trap door and we fall through it and you're done now. You made one mistake. That's not the God we serve. Abram made, he's, gonna, he's made some mistakes. He's going to make a few more. His son Isaac is going to make some mistakes. Jacob's going to make a lot of mistakes. And yet God still saw fit to use them. And yes, they suffered consequences for their mistakes, but God also saw them through. And so we see that balance here. So Pharaoh takes Sarai into his house. And this is where God takes matters into his own hands. Verses 17 through 20. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she is thy wife? Why saidst thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to, be my, uh, to me to wife. Now therefore, behold thy wife. Take her and go thy way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him. And they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. So God plagues the house of Pharaoh. What this looks like, we do not know. In Genesis chapter 20, we see this whole kind of thing happen again. Abram's now in the land of promise, but again he lies. Sarah says that, that I'm his sister. Again she's taken. And in that instance, God makes the house of the king barren so that none of the women could bear children until Abram prayed for him after restoring Sarai to be his wife. So the house of, of um, Abimelech is stricken with barrenness for that. But we don't actually know in this instance what the plague is that Pharaoh um, is experiencing. But immediately it appears Pharaoh understood what had happened. And whether that's through his own spiritual leaders or we have a conversation with Abram that's not written here, he calls Abram and he confronts him and he rebukes him for his lies. Pharaoh rebukes the prophet for putting him in a place where he might have sinned against Abram, against Sarai, and against God himself through taking her to wife. Pharaoh then restores Sarai to Abram commands the society to leave Sarai alone and sends him away. So that in many ways, I think we can see the actions of Pharaoh and his princes toward Abram as being far more indicative of personal integrity than the actions of Abram toward them. And what a shame that is in our lives. When we lean upon our own understanding, we try to do things our own way, it ends up not working out, and the world around us sees and maybe even exercises more integrity in the circumstance than we have. And our testimony before God, and even God's testimony before man, is harmed because we chose to lean on our own understanding. It isn't a pleasant thought goes without saying, just because you and I are followers of the gospel of Jesus Christ does not mean that we are automatically the most moral or ethical people in society. From a biblical point of view, we ought to be the most moral and ethical people in society. But that doesn't mean we always are. And that's not an observation by way of excuse. That's an observation by way of... Uh, it's an unfortunate observation, isn't it? 
Such is the case here. Pharaoh shows far more integrity than Abram does in this instance. Now, it's worth noting here, we'll see it again in Genesis 20, Abram is assuming that the people of the land do not fear God, and that, in many cases, is a wrong assumption. We're not that many years out from the flood. We're not that many years out. I mean, for most of Abram's life, as we studied several weeks ago, several of those first men that came out of the flood, Seth and his posterity, are still alive. And so there, there are likely many families of the earth who have not, who did not ap apostatize at Babel and instead would in fact choose to still know of and regard and perhaps fear the true and living God. So Abram was put into this place of compromise by his own choices. He faltered in his faith. He lost sight of the essence of God's promises to rest into the land that God gave him. He leaned upon his own understanding to solve his problems rather than leaning upon God and God's word. He did not stand in his integrity. Rather, he compromised his integrity for the sake of expediency. And again, I say, be careful not to heap scorn or dishonor on Abram for these things. I don't say them to do that, but only that we might remember that faith is not just a destination, Christian. It is not as if you can just step into the faith and say, I'm in the faith. Faith is a journey. It must be lived out. It must be lived out day by day. You must wake up every morning and say, I'm going to walk today by faith because it's easy to lean in your own understanding. But it also comes with consequences. Even if God, um, this is perhaps uh, not the best way to say it, but even if God will bail you out because he's got a plan for you and he's doing a work through you, don't put him in the place where he has to. We will not handle every circumstance perfectly in our lives, Christians. But God forbid that our humble recognition of our own frailty would compel us to excuse ourselves from the determination to live by faith regardless of the circumstances, to stay and to plant our feet in faith and in the hard day to not say, time to bail out, time to, time to run to my, my old faithful uh, uh, um, uh, backup plans, time to run to all of the, the safety nets that I've erected or society has erected for me. God, you had your chance. I've hit a roadblock. Now I'm out. God forbid that we would do that in the day of difficulty. I step out in faith. There are plenty of unknowns. I'm optimistic about my step of faith. I have every intention in trusting my Lord, but I have no idea what's ahead of me. And usually what I have in mind of what God is doing when I step out in faith on that early day and I say, I think I know what God is doing. I think I know where he's taking me. I think I know what he wants me to do. Oftentimes, usually, in my experience at least, what I have in mind is not consistent with what the experience along the, the journey will be. And perhaps one of the better examples of this in the Bible is Jesus' own disciples, specifically Peter, but all of his disciples, Recall toward the end of the Gospels, Jesus warns his disciples, and I'll read Matthew 26 to highlight this, verses 31 to 33. He says, verse 31, all ye shall be offended because of me this night. This was after the Passover, Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is saying that they are going to be offended that night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Verse 35. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet I will not, yet will I not deny thee. And notice this last bit. Likewise said, also said all the disciples. So Jesus tells his disciples here that they are going to fulfill the prophecy of Zechariah 13, verse 7, which says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. So Jesus cites himself as the shepherd, and he says his followers are the sheep of the flock, which will be scattered abroad that night. Now to this statement, Peter specifically speaks up. Peter has this tremendous faith, and also a tremendous capacity to put his foot in his mouth when it comes to his faith. 
And by the way, a lot of times those people that have the capacity to step out in faith in unique ways are also the ones that have a tendency to overextend themselves. So Peter says, though all others should offend, I never will. Jesus, of course, replies, telling him that he would deny Christ three times in the coming hours, to which Peter replies, though I should die with thee, I will never deny thee. And then the, all the disciples say, say the same thing. Now, these disciples were showing here true faith. And they had showed faith, hadn't they? They had left all to follow Jesus. Had they not? Had they not left their nets? Had Matthew not left the publican's table and followed Christ for these years? Had they not made the sacrifices with Christ? No place to lay his head? Had they not followed him in those days? They gave up their professions. We know some of them had family. Peter had family. Jesus heals his wife, right? We know Peter had family. He had children. He forsook them. And he followed Jesus for, for several years. And at the end of those three years, after sitting at Christ's feet and seeing the miracles and even performing these miracles themselves, you recall he sends out the 12, he sends out the 70. They come back with rejoicing saying, Jesus, even the devils are subject to us through thy name. They had seen these mighty works. They had performed these mighty works but when they were presented with Christ's arrest, trial, and subsequent crucifixion, what did they do? Their faith faltered, and they scattered. They were so confident that their faithful decisions to this point meant that they could not possibly forsake Christ, that the day that their trial of faith came, they actually failed it. Like Abram in his day, their faith faltered. And in this, we have both encouragement and exhortation, Christian. The encouragement is this. You aren't perfect. God knows that. He doesn't expect you to be. Now, when we see the idea of perfection in the scripture, and when I say you aren't perfect, we're talking two different things. So let me make that clear. When the Bible says that we, we are perfected in Christ... The idea of perfect, that, that Greek word, the idea as it's reflected in the Bible is finished or complete, having everything that is necessary to its nature or kind. The word perfect in the Bible does not mean flawless. It means finished, it means complete, having everything necessary, being fully equipped. That's perfection. When I say unto you, you aren't perfect, I'm not saying that you aren't perfect in Christ in that finished or complete way. I'm saying you aren't flawless. God knows you aren't flawless. If you were flawless, you wouldn't need him. You're not flawless. The fact that your faith falters is not an evident sign that you are an unbeliever or you're an apostate or even necessarily that you are a failure. What it's actually an evidence of is that you're human, which is a condition that afflicts all of us. And as humans, you aren't always going to make the right decisions. And a day of fear, shame, confusion may compel you to forget the promises of the God that you evidently love. That on your faith journey to the destination, that journey gets detoured by times where you are confused, where you are hurt, where you are angry, and you lean upon your own understanding and you step out of the way. And that's going to happen in your life. It doesn't have to happen. Because we have the Spirit of God, the sins, uh, chains have been broken. And the sp if, 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 we, if we were to walk every single moment in the Spirit, if we were to walk by faith every single moment, then we wouldn't falter in our faith. But because we're human, that happens. As the hymn writer so eloquent, eloquently put it in his day, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. There's a tendency to fall back upon our own understanding in this life, and that's human. Like Abram in his day, do not be surprised, Christian, when you face a set of circumstances that you neither desired nor anticipated, and in that moment you had 
desired so much to follow Christ, even unto death, but in that moment, your faith scattered. And you acted in a way that you otherwise would not have expected to the circumstances that you otherwise did not anticipate. It's certainly possible that when Peter and the disciples were insisting that they would not deny Christ, that they would follow him even into the death, it's certainly possible that Peter was saying in the back of his mind, forget this guy. I'm going to tell him that I won't deny him, but I'm out of here the first moment of trouble. It's possible that that's what was going through Peter's mind. It's possible that that's what was going through Matthew's mind and James's mind. And uh, John did kind of hang around after, after running for a little bit, right? But it's possible, but not likely. What's far more likely? Far more likely, they meant that. They believed that. They wanted that. They looked at that destination, which was Christ's kingdom, and they said, if this is the Christ and that is his kingdom, then I'm following this guy to that destination. But they, but they didn't know what they were going to face along the journey. Jesus did. That's why he told them it was going to happen. And they didn't anticipate, and then they didn't do the thing that Jesus told them to do. So, Pastor, are you telling me it was inevitable that they would falter? Well, prophetically, it was inevitable. But the fact of the matter is, Jesus told them the solution to not, right? Watch and pray. And they didn't do it. They could have hardened themselves for the battle of faith they were about to face, but they didn't. And so, again, I'm not, nor are we this morning, excusing Abram, in his wandering down to Egypt, the disciples in their scattering, we're saying it happens, we're understanding it happens. That doesn't mean it had to happen. Doesn't mean that the disciples couldn't have been watching and praying lest they fall into temptation and so have in that day stood in faith. But instead, they just kept going to sleep. It would seem unlikely to me that this was because they were very proud outright rejecting Jesus' warnings. It seems far more likely to me that in that day they simply did not know what was ahead and they did not understand their need. This shows a lack of wisdom. This shows a failure of perspective, not a heart of rejection or of apathy. Jesus' disciples faltered in their faith, but they would learn, they would grow, they would falter, they would be restored. They would get back up. They would get back on the path. And they would move to new heights of faith for Christ. Abram faltered in his faith. But he would learn. He would grow. He would get back into the land of promise. And he would be used by God. And through him, all families of the earth have been blessed. But as I give you these words of encouragement this morning, they are accompanied with words of exhortation, of warning as well. While no one is perfect, and God knows that, while we are all human and we should expect that our faith will at times falter because we are human, I say this by way of placing upon ourselves realistic expectations, not by way of alleviating us from responsibility and accountability. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 tells us that God has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, though that, that through God's Spirit, He has withheld no power or ability by which we are able to live lives apart from sin and live lives in faith. And while we recognize that we still sin because we are human and humans have bad days, when our emotions or our misunderstandings or our frustrations compel us unto faithfulness through carnality, God forbid that these reasons for faltering in faith should ever turn into excuses for faltering in our faith. God forbid that a humble recognition of my own frailty should metastasize into a dismissive attitude toward my own faithlessness. Don't let that happen, Christian. Because any faithlessness, even if it's going to happen, even if it's because we're human, these things do happen, and there's unanticipated things, any faithlessness comes with consequences. And we see that in Abram's case. Abram's case. 
His decisions were not without consequences. We might understand why Abram left the land of promise due to famine. We might understand his fears and his concerns that compelled him to lie about his wife. But Abram left the land of promise, whether in fear or in confusion, and it came with consequences. Pastor, he was delivered from the consequences. He wasn't punished by the king. God plagued the house of Pharaoh. Yes, and we talked about why. God's gifts and calling are without repentance. Yet there are some very stern warnings that we see in Scripture. Not to see God's grace as a shield for us to sin. This is what Satan attempted to do with Christ in Matthew chapter 4. Do you recall? When Satan took Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple in verse 6, and he said, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. Satan said, You want to prove that you're God? Cast yourself off from this temple, because the, God's angels will protect you if you are, in fact, the Son of God, if you're who you say you are. You remember Jesus' response? It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. God's prophetic promise that Jesus is the Son of God would div be divinely protected did not give Jesus license to throw himself off a building, to push God's sovereign purposes to the limits of God's prophetic promises. That's not why God has given us grace. God has not given you grace to push it to its furthest boundaries in your own sin or pride or selfishness. That's not why you have grace, Christian. Paul warns the same thing, right? In Romans chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, you know this well. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? The grace of God given to us does not entitle us to sin with impunity. Much to the contrary. Without that grace, I'm utterly and hopelessly lost. And that grace calls me not to continue in sin, but to walk in the spirit unto all obedience. And when we do continue in that sin that grace may abound, we can expect two results, Christian. First, it's more evident but less important. There are physical results for that. When I sin, that produces the wages of sin, which is death. I experience separation from God, which strips me of the fruit of the Spirit, produces instead in me the works of the flesh. We read about those works of the flesh last week. This brings the natural consequences of sin, both in my heart and depending on the circumstances, in the lives of those with whom I have relationships. Sin brings consequences. When I lie, when I lie to someone, there's a physical consequence for that. When I cheat, there's a physical consequence for that. When I steal, there's a physical consequence. Sometimes I get away with it, sometimes I don't. There are consequences in this life for doing those things. Sin puts me into darkness. I walk in darkness. I'm compelled to be selfish and proud. This brings more sin into my life. And the next thing I know, I'm in a spiral of sinful choices and that are driving me deeper and deeper. And now I'm doing things that I never thought I would do. And I'm in a place I never thought I could even possibly be. And that's what sin does in the physical. But far more important, if we're viewing things properly, the results in the heavenlies. We talked this morning in our Sunday school about the nature of Christian judgment. Judgment upon, the Christian, uh, upon God's church. Judgment upon God's people. The loss of reward in the day that I go into that city whose builder and maker is God. The eternal loss before the throne that is indicative of faithless choices. My faithless choices in this life might alienate my relationships, cost me opportunity, yield, uh, yield to personal regrets. These consequences are, are very real, and they're the ones that perhaps we even feel more heavily in this mortal body. But what about the eternal consequences, Christian? What about the loss of reward for those selfish decisions, for those faithless decisions? In Abram's day, he suffered some measure of personal consequence for his faltering of faith. He left the land of promise. It perhaps cost him settlement in a territory. He lost his wife for a time. He yielded his personal integrity uh, to the people of Egypt through deceit and misrepresentation. He harmed the testimony of God before the people of Egypt as a prophet of God and a representative of God. And yet he's the one that is lacking personal integrity in his life. But if we back up to that message that we thought about a couple of weeks ago in Hebrews chapter 11, Abram's journey was for that city that hath foundations whose builder and maker is God. 
this journey to Egypt was truly out of the way. Not just a physical detour out of God's land of promise. That's a metaphor for the fact that he experienced a spiritual detour out of that direction, that destination to that city, that half foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And whether or not we can see those results, whether or not you see the results of your faltering faith when you pragmatically decide to misrepresent yourself or to lie or to damage your integrity or whatever it might be as a, as a solution to a faith crisis. With those eyes of faith, we must acknowledge that such falterings cannot go without consequences before the throne of God. But God help us that we would walk toward that city whose builder and maker is God. Guard ourselves against being diverted in a way, against faltering in our faith, against wandering in the way. And it is with these thoughts that we step out of Genesis 12 and into Genesis 13 next week. Remembering that faith is not just a destination, it is in fact a journey. Yes, you have trusted Christ as your Savior. I hope you have. If you have not, come see me after the service. We'll get that taken care of. But there's coming a day. If you've accepted Christ as your Savior, there's coming a day when that faith will give way to its heavenly home. But the whole of the Scriptures compels us to believe that just as important as getting there is the manner in which we arrive. That the journey of faith that takes us to that city whose builder and maker is, uh, is God is important to God. And he has taught us that it should be important to us as well. So that when Jesus compelled his followers to have their loins girt and their lamps lit in Matthew 25, or when Paul warns in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 that they which run in a race run all, but not all receive the prize, exhorting us in verse 24, so run that ye may obtain. Or when James teaches us in James chapter 2 that faith without works is dead, being alone. These are not warnings that you might one day that God will pull the rug of salvation out from under you. We see nothing in Scripture that teaches us of that. But rather, these are warnings that a life of faith is not just about the destination, but it's also about the journey. And may it be so in our lives as well, that as we live in the Spirit, as we live in the faith, we would also walk in the Spirit, walk by faith. Thank you for listening to Pastor Jamin Wickler from Legacy Baptist Church in Buffalo, Minnesota. More information about Legacy Baptist Church and a library of sermons are available at www.legacybaptistchurch.net.